Well, you know, my view, Charlie, is very simple, that Syria is Iraq. Um, it's just the twin sister. Um, it's a Ba'athist regime, uh, ruling a multi-ethnic uh, society. Iraq had uh, a Sunni minority ruling a Shiite majority with Kurds and other minorities on the side. Syria has a Shiite major minority ruling a Sunni majority with Kurds and other minorities. They, they are mirror images of each other. Now, what happened in Iraq was we pulled the pin. Um, we, we removed the, uh, the dictator at the top, and that led to an explosion. And what America did in Iraq was the geopolitical equivalent. But we weren't prepared for what was going to happen once you removed the pin. We removed the pin, but we then did the geopolitical equivalent of falling on a grenade. We absorbed the entire explosion. We Iraqis most of all, but I'm saying our presence there prevented it from becoming a regional conflagration. Okay, And we then presided over largely because of mistakes originally, but in many cases was probably inevitable, a civil war as the parties contested the new balance of power. We let them each test each other. They finally reached a point of exhaustion and, and balance. We then midwifed a social contract between them. Um, and, and on the margins with special forces, we also hunted down and killed some of the most extreme elements. The product of all of that, 4,700 American lives, uh, 20,000 wounded, a trillion dollars, tens of thousands of Iraqis, uh, I, I don't know how many, but certainly, you know, well, you know, a very high number. The product of all of that is Iraq today, I would argue, Charlie, has a one in ten chance of a decent outcome in the long run. But it's because America was there to midwife this so transition. The problem with the argument is we don't know what would have happened uh, if that America had not done that. Right. I would argue, I, we, and we don't know, but I would argue Iraq would look like Syria today on steroids, you know, if it, it happened. And, and so I think... It might have somehow acquired nuclear weapons. We and who know. knows what. I'm, all I'm saying... Weapons of mass destruction. I'm saying the fact that it played out the way it did, that Iraq does is resolving its problems today, as we speak today, mm -hmm. by more politics yeah, than not. The Arab Spring would certainly have come to Iraq. Oh, it would have come to Iraq. I'm, you know, I'm sure of it. So, fact, uh, so oh, I'm sure of it. Been in power. But again, I think it would have looked a lot, but, but a lot more like Syria today. You know. But, okay, it's translate where Syria is today. So then, though. so then let's go to Syria. And so the problem is, everyone wants to say we, we must do something. And I appreciate God. I'd, I'd love to do something. Okay, but my my gut tells me that the only thing to be done is to do what you did. In, somebody's got to take over the country, okay? Somebody's got to provide a midwifing role to referee this new balance okay, of power. It, it, nobody wants the United States to do that. No, I know that. That's why there's, there's a little bit of disingenuousness right. to me about people pounding the table. We must do, what must we do? We must have a no-fly zone. Um, okay, yeah, and what happens when the Syrians shoot at the no-fly zone? What happens when the Russians get involved? Well, we need to I mean, the free yeah, I mean, and so it, it, it's it's the problem from hell. I, I it's it's terrible to see what's going on. Is there on any there, you know? answer in terms of somehow uh, a, a group of countries getting together, neighbors and others, including Iran, even though that would be very difficult for everybody, uh, to come to some kind of solution because they're the only Russians, Iranians, Americans, French. Get, you, know. you know, people would have you know and Arabs. Yeah. Again, Iraq work. To the extent that it worked, it worked because there was one power there. Now, right. can you imagine a committee of the Iranians, yeah, the Russians, no the one Chinese? Power be there to I know, this. and that's the that's my dilemma with this. So, um, I don't know how it's going to end. Um, I think this could burn on in different forms for a long time. Charlie, step back. What are we seeing? We're seeing two huge political orders crumbling at once. One is called the European Union. Right where the supranational state has failed, and the other is called the Arab world, where the nation state, in certain cases, well, the has failed. the monetary union has failed. Yeah, the monetary union has failed, and in the Arab world, the nation state has failed. So they're, they're both crumbling at the same time, by the way, at a time when we're not only more interconnected, but more interdependent than ever before. So I, I don't... The interesting thing yeah. is it has consequences for China and the United States. Absolutely. Both, both do. Yeah. China for energy in particular, right. America obviously... And China because they were, they were a market. Yeah. For, for, so I, I, there are problems that don't... I don't have a simple solution. I don't know what to do. Okay? I know what I think would be required to basically bring order to Syria, and I also know no one wants to do it. And what you long for on parts of both leaders who want to be president is for some sense of a vision how to engage these two huge problems. And what would you do, and what would you do different than what is being done? Let me talk about Syria. And, and, and this now applies to the wider Arab Spring. 
my, one of my favorite movies is the movie Invictus. Yes. The story of Nelson Mandela and the, played brilliantly um, by Morgan Freeman. Exactly, and the and the Springboks um, rugby team in South Africa, right. and how basically um, members of his African National Congress, you know, they wanted to change the name and the uniforms, everything when Mandela took over. And this, my favorite line in the movie. He turns to them, his minister of sports or whoever it was who was making this demand, and he says, no, we must not do that. We must surprise them. We must surprise the white minority by basically our, our by, by not doing that. I tell you what's been missing to me in the whole Arab awakening, and by, by the way, in leadership in general in the world, going back to the etch a sketch right now, when was the last time somebody surprised you, Charlie? When was the last time you called your producers and said, I don't care what it takes, get him or her on the show? Did, did you see that? Yeah. Did you see the risk they took? So in the Arab world today, you have no midwife in Syria and no Mandela. When you've got no Man Mandela and no midwife, you have a very difficult situation. And we're dealing here, at the end of the day, we also, you say, what should we do? What should they do? We're dealing here with the oldest civil war on the planet between Sunnis and Shiites over who is the proper heir to the Prophet Muhammad from the seventh century. Is that, is that my responsibility? Well, well, you know? I do think the United States has a leadership role and does have I'm a responsibility. All for it. It's not that you have to do everything, right. but you can be a catalyst for and other I'm all people for it. doing the right thing. But I think all I'm saying is we shouldn't be the only ones asking that question. What responsibility do they have to say, why, why are we fighting each other? Look, you've worked in the Arab world. Charlie, we both have Shiite, Sunni friends. I, I can't tell the difference between anybody. I'm, probably the problem they have with Protestants and Catholics and Jews. You know, what, what is this about, you know, that people can't live together? You know, so at a certain point, they have a responsibility too. That's all I'm saying. We must help. We must catalyze them all for it. Is there, 